Well, thanks for having me again, guys. Uh, thanks to Floyd and Gerhard and uh, a lot of others for putting in some hard yards to make this happen. Uh, and, you know, it's just fantastic from my point of view to see these issues being raised. And um, thanks, Floyd, for opening the conference. And uh, certainly agree with you on a lot of things. I guess I'm a bit more sugar centric, perhaps. Um, and we'll try and explain uh, a little bit of why that is. I thought I would reflect on some of the things I think I've learned about sugar uh, during my time in academia um, and then think about what we should be doing and some things I've learned about COVID and sugar um, during this time. So how long have we known that sugar is a problem? Any thoughts? 40 years. 40 years, yeah. So going back to the 1980s. Okay, yeah, yeah. And who first introduced sugar as a problem to the public? Uh, John Mitkin, yeah. Well, uh, going back in history, <laughs> we've seen sugar relentless, I'm uh, sorry, uh, Things got started really uh, looking at this epidemic of cardiovascular disease. This, uh, so before the 1900s, there wasn't a lot of cardiovascular disease, and there was this relentless rise. Uh, and the question is, what is the cause? And in 1972, there was a, a professor of nutrition, uh, John Yapkin, who uh, he had done a whole lot of work feeding rodents, chickens, rabbits, pigs, and even students <laughs> uh, sugar. And noticed the uh, triglycerides, a uh, marker of a risk of cardiovascular disease, was a problem. Also, serum insulin increased. Uh, serum insulin, obviously, related to type 2 diabetes. And there was also the key zero. Uh, so, uh, Keyes was an American physiologist, and he argued that saturated fat was the main cause of cardiovascular disease. And we had the Seven Countries study, and you can see a linear association between energy from saturated fat and coronary heart disease deaths. And you can see that, yes, if you don't take all the data into account, you can see a, a linear association. Uh, however, with all the data, the association is actually negative. And uh, in terms of ranks, cardiovascular disease, uh, those countries that have that eat the most saturated fat don't seem to have the most cardiovascular disease, so there seems to be a little disjunct in the evidence. There's also been a re-evaluation of, of various data that was collected early on. Uh, the Minnesota current experiment was an important one, and this came back in, in the BMJ. There was a tape of data that was dug out of the sum of the uh, main researcher of the experiment who uh, had since died, and that was reanalyzed, and very little difference in the group that was restricted kind of uh, saturated fat in that attempt. Uh, in terms of meta-analysis, so these are summary studies where we look at, there's so much data out there, it's very hard for people to keep abreast of it all, so we, we uh, summarize all the data and take a weighted average and many meta-analyses now showing no difference uh, in comparing groups that ate more saturated fat with those that ate less. And so recently the American Coll College of Cardiology has come out with uh, a state-of-the-art review and he said, the totality of available evidence does not support 
further limiting the intake of saturated fat rich food. And you may say, well, this is academic, it's not really that important. Uh, but I think it is because it comes up in nutrition labeling. And uh, here we have macadamia nuts, something that I don't think would uh, meet many uh, definitions of unhealthy food. They're certainly not ultra processed. But here we see that they have two and a half health stars compared to uh, Kellogg's Nutri-Grain, I think we would probably agree that that's ultra processed, about 25% sugar. A bit like starting the day with a more of a um, And here we have uh, cheese, which is given one star. So I think for me, what I'm trying to say here is that uh, targeting our policies on the evidence is, is actually important. Is sugar associated with cardiovascular disease? Um, I think people would may criticise the lack of evidence here. There hasn't been many trials, but the observational studies certainly show a very, very strong association going from the top 20% to the bottom 20%. You know, 100 of sugar intake in American adults, 140% uh, different. So, uh, in terms of uh, where the evidence is pointing, from my point of view, very strongly towards sugar, very strongly away from saturated fat. Uh, something I didn't learn a lot about at medical school was teeth for some reason. Uh, I think teeth are actually a really important canary in the long run. And uh, Rob Beaglehold will uh, be able to make some work on this subject, I'm sure. And some of the historical uh, papers by dental epidemiologists uh, absolutely clear on this. Without sugar, the chain of causation is broken, and so the disease does not occur. Oh, I looked at some data looking at food frequency questionnaires, comparing uh, kids that uh, and what they ate and what their dental records show, and we certainly saw that sugary and refined starchy foods were very strongly associated with carries. And here we've got uh, four or more servings uh, of sugary breakfast cereals. Some people don't know about the sugar content of breakfast cereals. Uh, often about 20, 30 percent sugar. And uh, a vast difference in terms of uh, rotten teeth. And when we put it all together in a regression model, we find that those who drink more sugary drinks, those who eat more white bread, uh, actually cheese uh, is protective, something I discovered through this uh, study for, for sugary drinks. Those that drink water, much fewer uh, uh, rotten teeth down the track. Everyone's focused on COVID-19, almost exclusively focused on COVID-19 at the moment. And I think what's been missing is that actually people who've done badly in terms of increased risk of mortality from COVID-19 have had features of very strong features of metabolic syndrome. So high blood pressure, obesity associated with a BMI of a 40 of an odds ratio of 6.2 for hospitalization. Cardiovascular disease, diabetes, 40% of hospitalized cases. Uh, age, very strongly associated with uh, hospitalization and death. And uh, to me, that's an indicator of a cumulative exposure to a certain product. Um, it's been disappointing, I think, given what we know about sugar. We are still arguing, as Boyd pointed out, 
for these policies that we think are absolute no brainers uh, UK's border and the sugar tax. The comparative evidence, I think, is compelling from an epidemiological point of view. We see sugar related to rotten teeth, rotten teeth related to cardiovascular disease, sugar related to high blood pressure, gout, uh, dyslipidemia, diabetes, very strongly associated with cardiovascular disease. You can find epidemiological evidence to support each one of those arrows. Whereas on the other side, I think it's much, much weaker evidence. It's not to say there's no evidence, but much weaker. So what, just summing up, what do I think is important? I think we need to prioritise sugar in terms of nutritional intervention. So I think the evidence is, the epidemiological evidence is much stronger on that. I think the number one policy for me is the sugary drinks uh, levy. The UK has done it. It's shown that uh, much sugar has been taken out of the food supply. Labelling is important. We know from the school studies that very few kids know how many teaspoons of sugar is going into their mouth when they pop over and make can of coke. Schools are a good place to start implementing uh, a normalisation of a sugar-free diet. And I think that's where we're aiming at. Thanks very much for looking